the term recovery gets thrown around quite a bit. People talk about improving the recovery. They look for ways of getting better recovery and very often they look at ways of measuring recovery. In recent years, we've seen a huge influx of monitoring devices that an athlete can wear on their wrists and quote unquote measure their recovery. People live and die by these values without realizing that it's simply not possible for these devices to measure your recovery in any meaningful way. The problem with the data you'll receive from these devices is that technically it's not wrong. It's recovery based off of the company's made up estimation. Their interpretation of the word based off of a few minorly useful data points. Recovery is multifaceted and no clear cut method exists to measure recovery. If there's no definitive way of saying what you need to do to measure what you're doing, then there's no wrong way of saying you're recovered, right? First of all, what do we even mean when we say we're recovered? Fully recovered means the individual is ready to perform a given task at 100% capacity. So you will match or exceed your previous scores. So what are we recovering from? So we're recovering from fatigue or fatigue from exercise in this particular scenario. There are three kinds of fatigue post-training, excitation, contraction, coupling, failure, muscle damage, and central nervous system fatigue. Now the interesting thing about all these is that they're essentially caused by the same thing, a buildup of calcium ions. During the process of excitation, contraction, coupling, which is essentially muscles contracting, calcium ions are released. As repeated contractions continue, the calcium ions, which are usually returned to the sarcoplasmic reticulum, fail to fully return. This buildup of calcium ions stimulates the release of proteases. These proteases damage the muscle fibers, which leads to, well, muscle fiber damage. And this then impairs their function temporarily, which leads to an inflammatory response, with the prevailing theory suggesting that this inflammation is responsible for central nervous system fatigue. So what we've got is damaged muscles that can contract, as well as a nervous system which won't allow optimal functioning. That's a pretty simplified version of a complex series of actions and reactions. What happens after this is what many of us are very interested in, the recovery process. Dissipation of waste metabolites, reduction in inflammation, muscle damage repair, and restoration of muscle glycogen are all part of the recovery process. These processes are complex and vary depending on a multitude of factors such as the individual, their training age, actual age, genetics, nutrition, what kind of training was done, what time of day it was done at, the temperature before, during and after training, and even how much effort they perceived they exerted during the training session. All of this sounds pretty complex, right? Sounds like it would be pretty tough to measure, even in a lab, in a controlled setting with string controls and all the compounding factors with a variety of different tools available to test the recovery process. If it sounds that way, it is because it is. Remember we said that recovery is the process taking us back to when we are capable of a 100% performance? Well, that is still one of the most reliable ways of testing a something impact recovery in a positive negative manner. Let's take a look at one of the more popular methods people believe increases their recovery, the sauna. In 2020, researchers looked at the neuromuscular and hormonal responses to different exercise loadings followed by sauna. Subjects were measured pre-exercise, immediately after exercise, immediately after the sauna, 30 minutes post sauna and 24 hours post exercise. The following data were collected, maximal isometric leg press, bench press, maximal rate of force development, counter movement vertical jump, serum testosterone, cortisol and growth hormone. We've got real world applications of force and power productions alongside biochemical analysis, which requires extraction and further lab analysis. This study is by no means unique in its rigor. You'll see the above all being very, very common methods of measuring the levels of fatigue from training. Anything less than these measurements would fall short of the accepted standard for fatigue analysis from training, while still only being a good estimation, not an exact estimation, of a subject's recovery state. Now let's look at what wristwatches measure. In general, it's three areas that you'll notice don't overlap with the lab-based measurements. Heart rate variables, sleep, and general activity level. They will essentially record each of these then using a formula of their own design, input said variables into the formula, they now put a score of your quote unquote recovery. Maybe these variables are very useful indicators and we're getting close to approximations of your recovery, right? Well, the heart rate variables they use are general indicators of your current state, mainly resting heart rate and your heart rate variability score. HRV is a very contentious issue in sports science. The implication is that a greater HRV score, the more relaxed you are, aka your nervous system has calmed down. The resting heart rate then is used as a compounding factor to this. If both the HRV is large and the resting heart rate is low, you're likely in a recovery state. Again, 
I'm using bunny ears here. But that's the problem. It's only a potential indicator that recovery might be happening. Not what and how much recovery, but that you're potentially in a state of recovery. One could, for example, do a five minute cold plunge and change your HRV. Does this mean you're more recovered? Well, not from what we know of cold exposure and recovery. What about sleep? Well, sleep watches only guess how much sleep you're getting based on your heart rate and activity. Low movements at night, but low heart rate is used as a grope in the proverbial dark at what you're doing right now. The only way to truly measure your sleep is using polysomnographic methods, which include measuring your actual brain activity. Finally, the use of a general activity score is taken into account using a pretty crude, but actually reasonably effective addition to measuring your recovery. Move less and you'll recover more. This is funny because I actually don't have a huge issue with this one. Less movement is less fatigue and very likely more recovery. But this alone is about as useful as an ashtray on a motorbike, or as we'd say in Ireland, tits on a bull. Wristwatches don't measure your blood values. They don't make you take a series of power and force production tests. They simply can't, and until they do, any recovery or similarly named score is essentially meaningless. I hope you enjoyed the video. Tune in next week to learn why you can't improve your recovery. You can only make it worse.